fresh shave when I remember to shave. It's All busy right. out here. <laughs> I went ahead and started recording. Um, um, we can go a little bit more into your uh, your beard grooming um, routine or your shaving routine <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> It, no, I'll leave that a mystery. That glow. <laughs> I, I'll leave that a mystery. I'll let y'all okay, figure okay. that out. <laughs> right, you can't give them all the secrets. You can't give them all the You can't. You can't. The game is to be sold. Um, I kind of been keeping uh, track of uh, what you've been doing with your brand, and you have a really good model going. Um, you produce some really quality. You produce really quality content. So I said, man, just let me reach out to him and see if I can get some of this, you know, knowledge and some of this experience that he's gained along the way. And then you uh, actually went out there and put out this great documentary, but we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first and foremost, um, yeah, man, thank you so much for joining me today. I surely appreciate you asking me to be on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Eddie Woods Jr., is who I'm sitting with today, and he is an ex-fellow Mighty Man. Yeah, I know y'all sitting there like, oh, why, why she only talk to people from Dunbar? Like, that's, that's not all, but still. Because we the best, that's why. Because we the best. We the true blue and gold. <laughs> City champs, state champs, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, all of that. So haters <laughs> gonna hate. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, Mr. Eddie Woods Jr. So man, just introduce yourself to my audience and let them know what's up. My name is Eddie Woods. Uh, I'm from the south side of Chicago. Uh, like Crystal said, I'm a fellow mighty man, you know, low end, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit further out south. I'm from a little bit further out south. Um, uh, 36 years old, uh, right now, uh, I, I do a uh, ministry where I teach Bible studies and stuff like that on YouTube, but also, uh, I was doing it, you know, live sessions before the whole COVID thing happened. And I also have a, uh, business, uh, the name of that ministry is Remnant Outreach Ministries. Uh, and I also have a business where where I uh, create content for uh, for businesses uh, to help them sell and also do marketing for them called Dominion Designs and Media. So Remnant is the ministry that you have and then Dominion is the media company. Right, right, right. All right. So the reason that I reached out to you was because I came across, I, I've been watching your content for a while now. And you said that... Um, you, we, we got a chance to speak a little bit briefly. You said that you started with the youth, you started with the ministry back in 2005. Mm-hmm. Right. Is that correct? Okay, cool. Right. And then you started the YouTube ministry um, in 2016. Right. So in 2005, we graduated in 2003. Mm-hmm. You two years out of high school that you had a gift and that this was where you wanted to go with your life. You kind of just want to start there and give us a little bit of a... How we got here? I mean, yeah, I mean, sure. Um, The way that it kind of started, I didn't grow up in church. Um, A lot of people that that are preaching at that age, I was 20 years old. Um, uh, I a lot of them are like, you know, church babies, preacher kids, stuff like that. I, you know, was the furthest thing away. Like every once in a while we would visit churches, but no, no, no. But something started to happen around 2004. Every time me and my friends would go out, we would go out, you know, to get something to eat or like we were like in the business trying to start businesses at that time. So we would go out to like little fairs and stuff like that. It would always be somebody to be like, yo, you guys know about the Lord. It'd always be some brother with some dreads, grayed in his beard and all that good stuff. Hey, you know about the Lord and all this stuff. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. Basically, basically. And so they'll be like, yeah, you know, I go to church, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting over there like, no. And every time they'll be like, yo, let me talk to you, brother. And they start, you know, evangel- trying to evangelize and all that stuff with me. And I'm telling you, this happened for about a year straight. So you grew up on the low end and then uh, you noticed I that- grew up on the- No, you no. didn't. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Knife. No. Okay. Well, you know what? I like that you don't have no problem boasting that you grew up on 79th Street <laughs> over the low end. So let's 79th and Ashland. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Okay, good. You know what? 79th Street and proud. He's from the nine. He says it loud and he says it proud. All right. <laughs> so mm-hmm. but you notice that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. I love that. No, sing it loud. Where are you from? You know, r- rep your set. But uh <laughs> but uh okay, so 
on the low end or like on the red line, like you notice like people were like ministering, like just spreading the word and getting their word out there. And you said that they kept coming to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't just, it was all over, like wherever we went, it was uh, like when we would go out, uh, do like stuff for the business that we were doing at that time, go to like little, uh, you know, those um, not festivals, but little fairs where you'd like be in a vendor or whatever. It would always be another vendor on the side, like, yo, brothers, what you guys doing? Hey, you know, you guys know about the Lord. And then next thing you know, all of them would be like, yeah, you know, I go to church, blah, blah, blah. Me over there, I'm like, no, oh, I don't go to no church. I don't know about that. <laughs> and so they, you didn't grow up in a church? No, I did not grow up in the church. I uh, I would go to church uh, with a couple of friends visiting every once in a while over the course of uh, my first 18, 19 years, but I didn't grow up in church. Okay. Um, and then uh, I say around at, at 19, that's when I finally gave in. I felt like a pulling. So I went, I went with him. And, you know, start learning, start, start reading. And uh, I just, uh, as the more I learn, the more I grew, the more I started telling people, uh, not about coming to church, but it's just about what I was reading, just about what I was learning. And it wasn't like, you know, hey, man, you go, you need to get right and go to, oh, you're going to hell. It was like, yo, man, I'm, I was kind of like breaking down what I was reading to a point where folks was understanding And then like people just started to come to the church that we were going to anyway, uh, just off the strength of that. And um, I started preaching because one day we actually went out, started doing evangelism. It was a new ministry. So we started doing evangelism. This was our first time. Our pastor was on the bullhorn in the park over there in Suli, uh, over there on King Drive. Um, And um, and uh, so he was was preaching. We handed out tracks. He turned around like, yeah, the Lord speaking in my spirit. One of y'all, one of y'all got a word in you. And I'm like, and my boy was like, not me. <laughs> he was like, no, <laughs> not I. And like, I was no, like, it can't be me. Sorry. <laughs> and I was just like, sure. <laughs> I'm, now, at this point, I'm 20. I'm 20 years old. I'm like, sure. And this is, I remember this is the summer. Um, I really just given my life fully to the Lord during that year. That first year I was going to church, I was, that was like the wildest that I was. I'm not even gonna lie. I was starting to read, starting to study, starting to get that conviction, but that was the wildest that I was, uh, was getting in a lot of trouble at the same time. And, uh, so, um, that following year when I turned 20, it was just like, I became like, I really started to understand like, oh, it's a gravity to this. It's a requirement of our life. Uh, that whole uh, presidential body is a living sacrifice. I started to really uh, uh, see what that meant that, you know, we submit ourselves unto the Lord because he's Lord. And if he's Lord, that means he's master. Um, so that he has the final say so. So when, when the past, when, when uh, Pastor Brown, Faith Walk Church, when he said, turned around and said that, I was like, sure. Why not? I could say something on here. I've been, I, I've been reading. <laughs> <laughs> you like it wasn't even me. It, it didn't even feel like it was me that was speaking. Um, and, and and it wasn't like you know trying to emulate him or anything like that. It was it was from uh, it was from within just pouring out everything that I uh that I had um I was learning and st- uh, still learning. And then so we were going out open air preaching. Um, I was doing open air preaching like for the next like. I want to say six, seven months, we would go out to the train station on 95th, go out to the train station on 69th. Um, And then I got licensed the following year, start preaching at the church. Then we really started doing evangelism hard, started preaching on on the train. You know, them brothers that be on the red line. I was one of them brothers. I was 20, 21 years old. I had a bunch of 20. I I had a crew with me at that point. So we going in there, just going out on the the, uh, train strong. We bringing people to the church. And it was just a a, a bunch of uh, like people that were in their early to mid twenties that were uh, just loving on the Lord because of what started with like a couple of us, a couple of us that were in our like early twenties were doing, and then started to do like stuff at the Charles Hayes Center Bible studies there, uh, and uh, started in 2017, 2018, having Bible studies at the uh, Salvation Army on 69th right off Halsted. Uh, but in the midst of all that, I dabbled with YouTube a couple of times, like, hey, let me, let me, let me put something out there. I opened my phone up, was in my bedroom, like, hey, 
this is yo, man. You gotta understand the kingdom. This this is mm-hmm. way better than sending out on 79th than Ashland. <laughs> Just I mean, out to expose, but you know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I love uh I got into ministry from from evangelism, and I, I still love that. Um, I still love going out, talking to people, uh, going out, praying with people. If we're outside, handing out stuff, um, stuff like that. Um, if, uh, if like people that are homeless, uh, having like care packages where we're giving them and stuff, stuff of that nature. Um, and just just doing that type of stuff as well. I like the person to person stuff. Fortunately, right now, you know, you have to use the more of a digital a- avenue. Um and I'm okay with that because of something that I was already doing. But yeah, I mean, that's pretty much how I got into ministry and where it, where it grew to or where it evolved to. I mean, yeah, it is something to be said about the fact that we are kind of forced to go the digital route when it comes to communicating and getting our, our work out there. But mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure that you've reached like audiences that you probably couldn't have reached just staying local, right? Like, have you like managed to reach some far out markets or gotten feedback from people way out far that really uh, yes. enjoy your message? Uh, yeah. Um, actually, um, we talked about it a little bit on the phone. Um, I started on like the digital platform doing a teaching on uh, blog talk radio It's like an internet radio broadcast services uh, service before like the whole podcast thing was a thing back in 2010 uh, with something called the takeover. And I was just teaching on there and all that good stuff. I got connected to a pastor out in Philly. We still connected uh, Pastor Leonard Robertson of Kingdom Vision Ministries. And so, you know, we got connected. He's been like a mentor for me. And like uh, he had me like on his calls because on his calls, he would be preaching to people overseas and stuff like that. Mm. He had me do that um, for about a year or whatnot. I was doing that. People in in Uganda and Africa. Um, This was back in 2011, 2012. And uh, and with the YouTube now, like people from London, they'll uh, contact me, message me, all that stuff uh, from the UK and all that stuff. So it's just been amazing what the digital platform has been able to do. Um, people from different parts of the country stu- uh, too. Um, I don't know where they're from, but they're 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 saying like, man, I'm following. Yo, you know, this has really been helping me and all that stuff, and that's all I want to do. I don't really care about the the channel is uh, starting to uh, grow, uh, starting to grow over the course of the last like year, year and a half. Um, but um, my whole goal, my whole purpose is really to help people grow as opposed to like numbers and stuff like that. Now, numbers are cool. You know, vanity metrics, when you're going out, when you're presenting it in front of other people, you know, in, in media, when you're doing that. People see like, oh, man, what, what are your followers? What are your subscribers? When well, you're trying to get other people on your platform. But. Other than that, it's really just, you know, I want the content content to be out there so that when people uh, come across it, they have something that can help them. Oh, that's why that explains why you'd agree to do my podcast, because I think I have all the 12 subscribers right now. So <laughs> I was almost thinking like, no, don't even bother him. He's doing he's over there making kingdom moves like he's he ain't interested <laughs> with your small potatoes. But I, I, I so it, it just shows that there was something in your content that kind of showed me like, because that's how I feel about my content. I really am like just really enthralled with the people that I talk to and the stories that I tell and the experiences that people are sharing with me. So that's really important to me. And I'm really happy with what I've been putting out there and Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the work. And if the numbers come, they come, but at the same time, I'm going to keep doing this as long as I'm able to do it. So, and it feels like that that's kind of like the path that you're on too. Thank you for like just kind of like plotting that course of like how Eddie Wood came from Dunbar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but how you can <laughs> how you managed to make it out alive from Dunbar. Was juking at the homecoming. <laughs> Y'all don't know nothing about juking. Let me let, let me tell you something, your kids. Oh, juking. Oh, <laughs> no, we're not gonna get it. No, back no. in it, back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, put it like this. I'm not even the youth minister, but I was just always so shy that when I heard uh, DJ Premier, when I heard, <laughs> when I heard the house music come on, I'm like, I'll excuse myself out the back door because I that, that, that just wasn't my forte. <laughs> my footwork wasn't on nothing. So I, had- I was in there like, yeah, <laughs> hold my shirt. <laughs> 
No, a good will, I can't footwork. Hold my shirt. Ooh, ooh. Hold no. your shirt? Okay. As <laughs> long, long as you wasn't getting backed all the way up to the uh, <laughs> to the gym room wall. <laughs> I'm not going to say nothing. No comment. Okay, you know what? Let's just move on before we say something incriminating. Before they start pulling up old pictures and videos. I think right. camera phones out there, too. So <laughs> Barely. Um, It'd be pixelated. They won't know who that yeah, is. <laughs> you can't make your faces. Hey, who is that? I don't know. Oh, is. That's looks like a glob. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Wow, dude, you're hilarious. Okay, so now let's go into. Oh man, I, hate, I almost kind of hate to go into the next like question, but that is kind of organically where we're trying to bring this to. I mean, if it takes a little comedy to bring a little light to it, then you know, so be it. Then let's do it. But um, mm-hmm. somewhere along the line, you said, I need to reach out to some of the young men in my vicinity to kind of create this uh, piece of content about police brutality and police, um, you know, involved shootings. Um, and tell me what got you there and how this project came about. Um, well, what got me there, actually, it was kind of all the stuff that was happening last year, we know, uh, or not even last year, over the course of the past, like seven, eight years um, with the Trayvon Martin situation, um, all the way up through, you know, the Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, all that stuff. Um, um, the responses that I was seeing from people that are not in our community and look like us. Uh, they were often, you know, if they just complied or um, this is the media trying to stoke something or this is social media, blah, 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 blah. And what was infuriating to me, it wasn't just uh, that I went through those situations, but people before me had went through those situations. And when I went through those situations or started to, there weren't, there weren't no camera phones when folks was, I mean, camera phones was there, but it was like, like I said, that little pixelated mm-hmm. four megapixel picture. It wasn't even no videos. And um, even then, like, wasn't nothing recording and no. And, and you think about your parents, your grandparents, they went through it too. And it was like one of the first stories I heard when I was like coming up, they were my, uh, I think it was my father and my uncle, uh, you know, how, you know, when it, when you, when you hear about a police officer passed or died in line of duty or something like that, you have to be real careful as far as going outside. You have to make your real, you have to make your outside uh, situations real brief because the cops are going to be out there just trying to knock some heads around regardless of who you are, mm-hmm. regardless of what you do. Um, and that stuck with me. Um, and so just going, having those experiences when I was 14, going to the park, like I said, I grew up on 79th of Ashland, uh, Foster Park was right up the street. So we would walk down Ashland going to Foster Park. And so I'm like 14, 15 years old. You had these squad cars that are following us trying to see if we're going to run for like two, three blocks. It's like me and like three, four other guys. We all teenagers. We all just walking, going to the park. They see us with our basketball or whatever. They think we're going to scatter. Uh, had situations where, you know, my first car was a 91 Bonneville, nice big box car that was black. So you got this big six foot dude in this big black car. I was getting pulled over every, <laughs> every other week, yeah, like literally every silly. other week. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was getting pulled over. It, you know, and so like when I heard those when I heard those people talking about, um, you know, it was just, oh, if you just comply, you know, nothing would happen. You know, like my la- one of my last uh, my, my second car was a Kia Rio, little unassuming car, little bitty car. It was like, little, you know, I remember the first time I, I remember when I got it, I pulled up to my house. I was still living with my mom at the time. My boys was outside. They're like, man, what's your big behind doing in that little cloud? <laughs> I got out. <laughs> So what time? The car shaming. That's the car shaming. Size, not car, not car shaming people based on their size. And their I drove a Chevy Sonic for six years. I'm telling you, they like. I'm, I'm five like, foot eleven, driving a Chevy Sonic, like which is basically the reinvented Cavalier. But you know what? Mm-hmm, that's okay. Mm-hmm. 
It's okay. We all got to start somewhere to get to where we go. Got to start point somewhere. Point A to point B, Eddie. That's all. Point A. To that's point. it. That's it. But like, w- like with that car, like it was completely unassuming. I remember this was in 2010. Um, 2000, either 2000. It was between 2010 and 2012. Me and two of my other friends that grew up next door to me because I was at my mom's house. Uh, they were at their aunt's house, which was ne- right next door. Uh, we were like, "Hey, let's go to Papa T's." Papa T's wasn't that far. It was up. You turn. Go up 74. If you go down Western, mm-hmm. you right there. So we coming back from Papa T's after we get our pizza. Um, and so we turn down Damon on 63rd. Next thing I know, I'm pulled over. They literally yank my buddy out the car. They yank him out the car. They ain't, they ain't, ain't nothing. They yanked that man out the car, had him hemmed up on the side of the car. He like license registration. I'm like, okay. Then next thing you know, oh, we thought you were somebody else. We thought you was, you, you looked like somebody that was who up the band. Mm-hmm. You know, now this is the, the unassuming car. Now I went through that almost every other week with the Bonneville. This was the little unassuming car that still happened. And so like having those types of uh, stories, hearing those types of things, even at where I work, uh, like I, I still have a full time job and it's mostly Caucasians that work there. Like all the stuff that was happening, uh, nobody really said anything, even with the, uh, the last thing with the uh, George Floyd, you know, offices were closed because of civil dis- uh, disturbance, but nobody really were dealing with the issues. Mm. I actually uh, at that point, it's just kind of snapped. I kind of snapped. Yeah. I actually As sent the email. <laughs> I sent the email to the vice president and the president of the company. Oh my, okay. Uh, um, like, yo, why y'all not in front of this? You know, we got black African Americans that live here, that work here. We feel some type of way, blah, blah, blah. And then at that point, I'm like, man, I gotta do something. I, I at least have to put the stories of people that have gone through the same situations that I've got, because I know there are plenty out there. And then I was like, I don't want to deal with people that are just in my age group. I want to show these people that this has been happening to people that are even older than me. Um, So, you know, I called and text uh, as as many brothers as I could. I got six people that that is stuck. And so I interviewed those six people. And um, that's that's how I went. I actually interviewed them in um, around Juneteenth of uh, last year. Mm-hmm. Um, but due to some personal issues, I hadn't had a chance to really get into the uh, the edits of it. But then when I, I was able to edit it uh, this early at the beginning of this year and start putting them out. Okay. All right, cool. So let's just kind of, you know, do that brief, uh, you know, recap real quick. So you said, you know what? I've had these experiences when I was younger. I was an unassuming young teenager, not really getting into too much of nothing. But you, from your perspective, you felt like there were a lot of things going on internally with the police department that kind of made them lash out at the community when it came to young men like you. You did kind of fall into that that stereotypical look and everything, and it was mm-hmm. it was a hard pill to swallow. I know it must have been. Um, me personally, myself, I, I try not to go too deep into the details of it, but yeah, I've had some. No, we'll put it like this. The only time I've had a gun pointed at my face was by a CPD officer. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was 17 mm-hmm. years old. And yeah, yeah. it did instill a deep distrust within me when it came to the police. Like, I, probably up until a couple of years ago where I became aware of, like, you know, good programs yeah. and good police officers that are out there mm-hmm. and are working with the community and trying to do good. Yeah. I literally had it ingrained in me that all police officers suck. Police officers mm-hmm. don't care about people. And I've never been helped in any productive way by a police officer. Only mm-hmm. harmed. <laughs> and oh, then- yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The mm-hmm. main thing, it was uh, one particular instance um, that actually happened. I was robbed at gunpoint coming out of my car. I was 19. Uh, they, you know, all they got was my phone. It wasn't even, I didn't even have nothing. I just had a phone. Uh, they took the phone, ran off. The dude actually shot in my direction. Um, and so because there was a gunshot, uh, well, when I called at first, they were, I was just like, you know, I was robbed. They were like, come down to the station. I was like, I'm robbed. I don't feel comfortable right now going outside. They like, well, come down to the station. Then I told them that shot was, that a shot was fired. That's when they were like, okay, the police will come. So the police got there. I'm, I'm 19 years old at this point. Uh, and they are like, it's like 10 o'clock at night. 
My mom's upstairs. I told her about what was going on. And the police came like halfway up the stairs because we were in an apartment building. Uh, they came halfway up the stairs and they were like, well, why don't you just come down to the car? I'm like, come to the car. I don't feel comfortable coming to your car. I don't feel comfortable going outside, sir. Uh, my mom was like, well, y'all can just come upstairs. No, you come down to the car. You come down right now. Like getting forced. I called them. <laughs> I'm the one that called them. I'm 19 years old. So I'm I'm in a situation where I'm just like, you know, I'm being forced to be in the back of the squad car. Like I'm the one that did the crime. They basically like they took the report, but they didn't take it seriously. Um, in their minds, I was just basically some dude that's out here probably doing the same thing. So they didn't really look at it anyway. And so it was that that right there. That's what really rubbed me the wrong way regarding police. Now, now I'm at a I'm at a uh, point where I don't like view them all as like it, uh, as this or that. Um, however, I do agree with some of my friends where it's like, you know, I understand that you have to, uh, they're thinking about like the good ones. They're thinking about themselves, their own safety, as far as like trying to report or anything like that, because we've seen stories where you see police officers report certain things and they themselves got in trouble. They lost their, they lost their job or something else. And so like you, they think about that, but at the same time, you still have these others that are going around kind of unchecked or their check is kind of like just a slap on the wrist. And so that's what really kind of, um, Thinking about all those things that are happening now and thinking about that, that's what kind of motivated me to to do this. Yeah. And just <clears throat> just really quickly, um, I have like the exact same story. Like I had I think it was uh, at one point I, I dropped my key. I had a car. I actually had my husband's car. We were dating at the time. And I was walking into the house, dropped the key on the way inside the house, got inside the house, started looking for the key. And it's like, oh, crap, where's the key? The alarm is going off. So somebody had it and young lady jumps in, she reverses it and drives it into a fence and hops out laughing and, you know, runs away. I called the police. I'll never forget. It was 12 degrees below zero that day. Mm. They pulled up. They never got out the car. I stood outside the truck. I sat there and I, and I was halfway through like getting my hair done. So my hair was like half wet and I'm standing outside. It's like 12 below. And they questioned me from the warmth of their truck and me standing outside and 12 below, like shivering and trying to answer questions. And I said, can I go get a sit in my car and get warm again? Well, we're almost done. We're almost done. And it's just like, they never mm -hmm. asked me to sit in the back of the car. <laughs> Hmm. It was so petty, but, but in that state of mind and in that, and in my youth, like I didn't have the wherewithal to step up and say, Hey, I'm cold. Can you at least let me sit in that warm truck that you're sitting in, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> or can you, can we go inside to somewhere that is warm? Like they didn't even want to get out the car, but that was just one of many <laughs> interactions with Chicago hmm. police that kind of like shaped my perspective of, Hey, you know what? These guys really don't care at the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. So that was your personal experience. So tell me a little bit yeah. about how it felt when you got into interviewing the other guys. Um, what, what I found is that uh, regardless of, of age, um, even one of the guys that I didn't actually get a chance to interview, uh, we talked, he was a former police officer. Um, we've all had experiences um, where we were some, some, some stuff kind of escalated where it didn't need to, um, um, uh, whether it was some force that was used or the, the tone or the reason we were even stopped in the first place, um, that this is something that can't be continued to be ignored because I feel that it is. Uh, you, you, you see in mainstream media, the main thing is just comply. These people were complying. Um, these people were doing what the officer said and it still kind of, you know, left them with some uh, like a, a bad, uh, bad taste in their mouth. Even uh, with the uh, the one that I just released on the other day, his wasn't like any type of use of force, but just the pettiness in which, you know, the police officer did things. 
it it left them to a point where, you know, like what I said with the unassuming car, like they like, you know, I just need to drive an unassuming car. I need to just do like this, do like that. And they've been kind of living like that for since then, um, mm-hmm. even in another state, city in another state that's still in their mind. So uh, that's the one thing. That's the main thing that I saw. Like, you know, all these stories are similar. We're all alike in that way. Um, even those that I'm seeing, like, even those that try to be like, ah, that, that are, that are skin folk that might not necessarily be kin folk, but skin mm-hmm. folk, uh, they even have stories like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you think about one, so many one, of them. Mm-hmm. Like you, you think about the prominent when, um, what's her name? Candace Owens. Like she sued organization because of that she so, made her way onto my podcast it's <laughs> okay go ahead well, you can bleep that out you can bleep that out all right, all bleep right. that out but yeah. uh <laughs> it's a curse word on this but 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 i mean that's the, the 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 truth is like we've all experienced that type of discrimination especially if we went outside of our uh our neighborhood um or even or if we've had interaction with the police regardless of what color they were um and it's just i was just like you know just kind of blown away um and at the same time i knew that that was going to be the case uh, even with that being the case, like like I said, the one, one of the guys that I wasn't able to get an interview with because of time, uh, our schedules were just conflicting. Uh, he was a former police officer. He didn't feel like, you know, all police officers were bad. You know, he knows they're good ones and they're ones that kind of go, you know, out of their way to be uh, butts for terrible. lack of a better word. Yeah. Uh, tain- uh, yeah, terrible. <laughs> but he also had experiences where, you know, he was, you know, pulled over or stopped or detained for no good reason other than, you know, oh, I'm, I'm a little bit of darker tint. You know, I have a little melanin up in here. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I see why you're stopping me, officer. And it's, and it's, and it's crazy. Uh, and so I wanted to get that, get those stories out there just to, mm-hmm. just to share that. But yeah. Well, that's a uh, powerful man. Like, especially like uh, it, I would have loved to hear the perspective that that police officer would have been able to share, but uh, I've actually had the privilege of speaking with the police officer myself. Um, I did interview him for the podcast, but because of the way police relations are right now, I decided to stay away from the police officer aspect of it as much as I could. And, yeah. but he, I mean, the, the the police officers that I have been in contact with, they it's not that they don't deny it, it's almost like they can't deny it at this point, that mm-hmm. it's real. And right. the steel, what do they call it? The blue curtain or the steel blue wall or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's not going nowhere no time soon, but it's being chipped away at. And yeah. they're starting to hold each other more accountable just like in everyday conversation and and in their uh, overall actions and their um, behaviors. So that hopefully that does like bring us somewhere that we need to be. Um, So so learning what you learned about police um, interactions and everything from this document. And I do recommend that all of my listeners go over to his page real quick, just drop your handles online on social media and YouTube so that they can like get more perspective on the stories that you just shared. Um, okay. Well, my, uh, handle on, on YouTube is Eddie Woods remnant outreach ministries. Um, the handle on Instagram is E Woods, JR eight four. Um, I don't have any separate one for, uh, for the ministry on, uh, on Instagram or whatnot, but that's where the uh, the uh, the documentaries are posted. Posted. I have them on the YouTube page as well, but I have them as unlisted uh, for right now. I do want to uh, uh, probably have its own YouTube channel for that uh, because the YouTube channel that I have now is for ministry. I want that to be like highlighted for on its own on its own platform or whatnot. But for right now, you can check out the documentaries on my Instagram. Like I said, it's at EwoodsJR84. So what I will say is that um, I have worked with a lot of good people in Inglewood because you did describe a lot of Inglewood, West Inglewood areas, and, and that is my home neighborhood. But there are a lot of great people out there doing 
some great work in the community to improve community relations. Now, don't get me wrong. I do make it known like the really messed up experiences that I've had personally when it came, when it comes down to, you know, just the lack of help and the um, overall opposition that police tend to pose in low income neighborhoods. So yeah. I feel that we are in a space where we're able to have those conversations a little bit more openly. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like there are more police officers out there willing to listen nowadays, sometimes too much. Sometimes you, <laughs> you do be in a situation and you be like, man, dude, like crack a skull or two, like, you know, let's get this settled. But at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, I can't, uh, I can't go into detail, but man, I was just in a situation where I had, Woof, like eight police officers around and <laughs> it was two supervisors <laughs> and everything and no handcuffs were going on. I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's just try to get through this situation the best that we can. <laughs> but, um, but the conversations are being had and mm -hmm. accountability is being shown. And I feel like you are doing some great work because this is a part of that. Um, I did get a chance to watch part one of the, the Borders bookstore, that story of just trying to go to work and come home and being this close to being framed for, uh, you know, distributing a, a controlled substance when all you're right. doing is waiting on the bus when you just got off of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, powerful stuff. Please go by and check out um, his documentary. Um, so I guess what I want to ask before you leave me is that, like, like we said before, we talked on the phone, you was like, oh, I, I was saying like, man, I find myself catching up a lot with um, old, you know, classmates because we've come so far from Dunbar. And you said, oh, yeah, 15 years. Exactly. It's been. And it's like, dude, no, it's been 18 years. Actually, it's been 18. We old out here. 18 whole years. There are children that are seniors right now. Or a freshman in college <laughs> that were born the year we get graduated. <laughs> Just twist the knife in, make sure it's in nice and deep. So, so that, that's so what I do. <laughs> <laughs> you're stabbing that proverbial "I'm getting old" gut. So, <laughs> so yes, okay, fine. He had to correct me. Eighteen years has been since we came out of high school. God, oh, all right. <laughs> so, eighteen years since high school. So, if you were able to go back in time and say to that, speak to that young man, Eddie, that was on the train stations with your crew, busting down the doors and like busting people in the face with the word of God. Like, what would you say to that young man, Eddie? Or what would you say? And would you listen to yourself? Um, I would say that you don't have to live for other people's expectations. Um, other people's expectations of you are theirs, but you're the one that has to live with the decisions. Um, so just think about that. Um, and to be honest, I would have pondered it. I might've still did something, but I would have still pondered it. Um, and eventually taken that on, uh, sooner, uh, than I did realize that sooner. Um, because I feel like when I was younger, I was, you know, uh, trying to be the the good good young man the good preacher the good this the good that mm -hmm. um versus just trying to be me yeah. and figuring out who i was and i made a lot of decisions that were um just just wasn't good and trying to do that uh trying to impress or trying to appease or trying to live up to other people's expectations instead of figuring out what i wanted to do for myself what god had actually given me to do like i actually stepped back from ministry from a little bit because i was like is this really what god wants me to do or is this what other people expect of me mm -hmm. um and i had to just kind of figure figure out those things and uh yeah that's that's what i would leave with my younger self yeah okay so you would probably be relieved to hear your older self say that because it sounds like you were probably kind of going through some conflict at the moment that and that mm -hmm. probably would have offered you a lot of clarity at that moment right yeah yeah definitely mm -hmm. definitely so when it's all said and done, after all of the different avenues that you've gone through with the YouTube, with the ministry, with the red line, um, which one which, which one do you want to be your legacy? What do you want people to think of when it's all said and done and you left this earth? Um, well, first, I want uh, my family to know that I did everything that I could for them. Um, uh, regarding people around, uh, I just want 
people to have been impacted by the uh, life that I lived, not even um, the teaching or whatever, but just the life that I've lived and be inspired to live their best life because of that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it, you know, and people to come to the Lord, come to Jesus. Come. You can be different in whatever um, vein that you're trying to be in. Um, you don't have to conform to the norms of what people try to put on you. Uh, and you don't have to fit yourself and uh, be in this little box that people try to put you in, but you can do what it is that your imagination um, uh, allows you to do, uh, what it is that you have a passion for. You, it is possible. Um, like, you know, people are like, man, I'm too old to start this, or I got this and that and stuff like that. I'm 36 years old, and I'm out here trying to, you know, get this, uh, get a business going, ministry going, all this stuff. Um, and people would say, oh, man, you got to start certain things when you're in your 20s and whatever. Or you have to do it this way or that way. You don't have to do it any of those ways. Uh, you can do it the Lord's way. That's all I want to say. Do it the Lord's way. Do it the God Lord. bless you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, Eddie Jakes, uh, Bishop Eddie. Uh, <laughs> that's what you sounded like just then. Um, okay. So, get ready, get ready, get ready. Exactly. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, tell, them, tell them where to find you at, Eddie. Tell, one more time. I know you went over it, but I love to do it at the end. So just that we can get that clear punch at the end. Hey, come and find me here. Okay, okay, cool. If you're looking for teaching and preaching, hallelujah, mm -hmm. uh, Come on now. you can uh, check us out on uh, YouTube. The page is Eddie Woods Remnant Outreach, uh, Remnant Outreach Ministries. Uh, you can search either one of those and you'll be able to find me. Or And if you're uh, on Instagram, uh, if you're looking for more of that good ministry stuff or you want to check out the documentaries, you can check me out. Uh, my Instagram handle is eWoodsJR84. Uh, Again, that's eWoodsJR84. Um, and if you're a business that needs content and stuff like that, uh, shameless plug, go ahead, find me on Instagram, Dominion Designs. Uh, the, the handle is Dominion DMLLC. That's Dominion DM LLC. You can check me out if you're a restaurant or whatever you are. Come on through. I got you with the content, with the marketing piece, whatever you need, fam. Whatever you need. All right now, man of many hats. All right. So basically, <laughs> you're basically like the online version of the man that used to sell the oils on the train. Like you got the oil, you got the socks, <laughs> you got the bags of candy. You got everything you need. In like when I get my fur coat, you will know. <laughs> when I get my fur coat, Spam be rocking that fur coat. It be 110 degrees. He's still out there in that fur coat. He used to carry the oils like a like like a magazine. Like what do you those things that they hold the bullets in? And he would open it up and like snatch the oils out and be like, "What you need? I got you. I got you. Mm -hmm. Moon breeze, sandalwood. What else? What you need? What you need? I got you." So yes, whatever you need when it comes to the media tip, the teaching and preaching, he's got you covered. Um, Eddie, keep doing your thing, man. This is really inspirational. And I look forward to what you have. Oh, and what's next for you? Do you got anything that you want people to look out for coming up soon? Um, right now, just just uh, dropping the episodes for uh, the um, police uh, brutal brutality uh, interviews that I've did. Uh, so I'm doing two per week. Um, I have six episodes in total. So we have two dropping this upcoming week, Monday and Thursday, and then Monday and Thursday the following week. Okay, that's what's up. All right, thank you so much, Eddie. And uh, again, thank enjoy you. the rest of your weekend. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing the rest of those parts come out. So... Thank you again for having me. I appreciate it.